is mine and I am His. What can I want beside? What can I want beside? He leads me to a place where heavenly heavenly pasture grows, where living waters gently pass and full salvation flows. And full salvation flows. If ever I go astray, He does of my soul reclaim and guides me in His own right way for His most holy name. For His most holy name. Good morning. Are we on? Here we go. Sorry. I didn't come in and do the mic check earlier because um, I got busy. So if you're a guest at uh, Twickenham this morning, welcome and happy new year to everybody. So I'm looking forward to 2016. I think in a lot of ways, it's going to be a really exciting year for us. And I just kind of like the new beginning anyway, because it's just kind of fun to see what's going to happen next. So exciting. So we're glad you're here. Uh, If you are a guest, again, we're really thankful that you chose to start your new year with us. Maybe that's a part of a New Year's resolution for you. And if it is, we're we're honored that uh, you decided to start that here. And if we can help with that in any way, we would love to do it. I thought about just having people raise their hands and tell us what their New Year's resolutions were, but then I decided it would be more fun if we started confessing sins. So I'm gonna start over here. (laughs) No, we won't do it that way either. We're just glad you're here. I hope, you, I hope it comes through almost immediately that uh, two things are true about Twickenham. We, we don't take ourselves very seriously, but we do take God's Word very seriously. That's, that's kind of the balance we want to maintain. We want to take this as seriously as we can, but not ourselves. Uh, and we want to have a good time, but we want to be aware of why we're here and who we're here to serve and to worship. So glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you uh, have a prayer need, you can write that down on one of the cards uh, in the seat, uh, back of the seat in front of you, and then you put that in the collection plate when it goes by later in our service. We'll pray over that tomorrow in our staff meeting. We'll make sure our elders get it. If you want the whole church to know, we'll make sure everybody knows. But if you want it kept private, just indicate that on your note. We're just really, really glad that you're with us this morning. Let's go ahead and stand up. I want to share a scripture with you that really ties in with what we're going to talk about today. We're sort of focusing on the concept of of sheep and shepherds and what it means to be led and what it means to be a part of a group, a part of of something larger than yourself. But uh, this is from Psalm 100. I just love this passage. It's one of my favorites and I think a great way for us to begin our worship in 2016. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name because the Lord is good and his love endures forever, his faithfulness throughout all generations. Let's praise him together. Glad you're here. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter. I will not faint. He is my shepherd. I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Let us be faithful, faithful, faithful Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe, let us be faithful, faithful Lord. We believe in a God who is able to bring justice and mercy to all. And he promises strength for the journey 
too steadfast to answer the call. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. And though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in the truth of the Bible, in its power and purpose today. There is meaning and life in its pages, we believe and we choose to obey. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. And though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe that He's calling His people to embody his story of grace, bringing rescue and hope to the broken. May our lives be an offering of praise. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. And though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, Faithful, let us be faithful, and though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful, let us be faithful, and though we cannot see. We still believe, let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Would you be seated as we read from First Peter this morning? To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Let's take our offering. I am a sheep and the Lord is my shepherd Watching over my soul My soul to keep guarding over me ever Watching wherever I go. And when the winds blow, He is my shelter. And when I'm lost and alone, He rescues me. And when the lion comes, He is my victory. Constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. We are his children, and he is our father, watching over our soul. Great is his love for his sons and his daughters, watching wherever we go. And when the winds blow, he is my shelter, and when I'm lost and alone, he rescues me, and when the lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me. And when the winds blow, he is my shelter, and when I'm lost and alone, he rescues me. And when the lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. His name is... 
is master, Savior, Lion of Judah, blessed Prince of Peace, Shepherd, Fortress, Rock of Salvation, Lamb of God is He. minister in the corporate world of Intergraph, I took my leadership team through a study of Dr. Kevin Lehman and William Pentak's book entitled The Way of the Shepherd, Seven Ancient Secrets to Managing Productive People. The book is a modern day parable that speaks to managing based on your heart, your character, and your priorities. It's countercultural and flies in the face of many ways that you hear a corporate world managed today. It's basically the story of a business executive who mentors an MBA student through seven of the great principles of management. And it doesn't take very long to realize that the book is steeped in biblical principles. The MBA student is taken to a pasture where the businessman tends to sheep in his spare time. And he describes to the student how tending sheep is similar to managing people. The seven principles used to teach how to manage people are based on ideals that a shepherd uses in tending and caring for his flock. Briefly, the seven principles go this way. First, the shepherd must always know the condition of his flock. He must constantly check on his flock. He must constantly interact with his flock to know how they were doing. Secondly, to lead your sheep, you have to know their shape. SHAPE is an acronym for strength, heart, attitude, personality, and experiences. You have to understand the life experiences of your sheep, of the people that you're managing in order to help them. Thirdly, you have to help your sheep identify with you by building trust, by modeling authenticity, integrity, and compassion. For great leaders, leadership isn't just professional, it's also personal. Fourth, you have to make your pasture a safe place by ensuring that everyone is informed, by ensuring that everyone is important, and by culling instigators who might come into the flocks. Fifth, you have to use a staff of direction to keep your flock moving in the right direction, to set expectations, and to rescue them when they go astray. Six, sometimes you have to use a rod of correction to protect your flock from predators, to discipline as needed, and to regularly check on their progress. And finally, you have to make sure that you have a heart for your sheep and that you are willing to bear the burden of leadership, which is a lifestyle and not just a technique. What distinguishes a great leader from a good leader is that a great leader has a heart for his people and a genuine care and concern from them. Now, if when one wanted to, he could take these seven principles and easily begin to relate them 
to biblical principles within the Bible. Principles on how elders are to shepherd their flocks, but also principles on how the greatest shepherd ever, Jesus, keeps watch over his sheep. In John chapter 10, Jesus tried to explain some of these concepts of shepherding to the Pharisees, but they did not understand. The statements he made, such as, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, and I am the good shepherd, the she I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, simply weren't what they wanted to hear. But why did the good shepherd, why did Jesus use this good shepherd and the sheep metaphor to describe his relationship with his followers? Well, he knew the importance of sheep having a good shepherd for many reasons, not the least of which is that they would always have a leader to follow, and specifically, in our case, a person by which they could example their lives by. And in the greatest of ironies, the good shepherd became like the sheep and ultimately the Lamb of God, slain for sinners, to provide a hope for eternity. Revelation 7.17, John describes this twist as he writes, For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Would you pray with me? God, we come to you this morning um, as we take this communion, as we take this bread. As we spend this morning uh, talking about shepherds and, and discussing concepts of flocks, God, we are thankful that you are our shepherd and that you guide us and that you lead us. God, that sometimes you correct us and keep us on the right path. And God, none of that would have been possible without you becoming flesh and coming to this earth and becoming like us and ultimately becoming the lamb slain for us. And so as we take this bread, as we remember the body of Christ broken, help us to examine ourselves and to think on these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Gentle shepherd, come and lead us, for we need you to help us find our way. Gentle shepherd, come and feed us, for we need your strength from day to day. to help 
bow with me. God, once again, we approach your throne just thankful for all the ways you bless us and all that you do for us. Most of all, God, we're thankful for uh, Christ's body that was given for us on the cross. God, we're thankful for the mercy and the grace uh, that flowed in the blood that can wash us and cleanse us and make us whole. We can't do that on our own. And so we thank you for that grace that makes us righteous in your sight and acceptable before the throne of God. As we take this cup, help us to remember in Jesus' name, amen. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God. worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God.
Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing a word, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guide His children. In His arms, He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. On His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with Hosanna's ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. So this morning is going to be um, not your typical first Sunday of the New Year sermon, right? Typically, I would think that what preachers do and what people are looking for is like some big, wow, let's go out there and really get them this year, or here's how to keep your New Year's, I got a foolproof way to keep your New Year's resolutions, by the way, don't make any. All right. So you should have been doing that stuff anyway. So, but we're not going to, it's really not going to have that kind of flavor this morning. It, uh, it's going to be, um, it is going to be foundational. I, I would call what we're going to talk about here very foundational. So can you hang, can you give me five minutes? Just give me five minutes. If you're in the balcony, you guys only need to give me two because you guys pay attention anyway. So, all right, my people. So recently, uh, in response to uh, input that, that you gave through our survey, uh, which was a year and a half or so ago, but recently the staff and elders developed a more intentional way of seeing to the spiritual needs of our members. We arranged the church into flocks. Uh, as in flocks of sheep, because that's a real, the, the Bible uses that metaphor just a ton to talk about a group of people, specifically the church. So we arranged the church into flocks and we uh, assigned each flock to a shepherd or an elder. The Bible uses the terms shepherd, elder, um, overseer, pastor interchangeably uh, to describe the same role. In fact, we've got 11 elders shepherds, pastors here at Twickenham, uh, one, of, uh, one of which is on a sabbatical. So we've got 10 active elders. And I want to just have them, I'm going to call your names. I want you and your wife to stand, okay? Uh, and just remain standing until we're done. Uh, Dan, and right over here, Dan Beasley and Tammy, uh, his wife, Lee and Julie, they usually sit over here. I kind of know where all the elders sit, so I know where not to sit. Uh, Todd and Laurie Beth, you guys are usually in the back. Oh, you're over here. Are y'all moving? What is the? Okay. Uh, Ken and Suzanne, and they are usually over here. Yeah. Walton and Marna are right here. Harless, Tom and Christy, they usually sit in the back. Hmm. <laughs> John and Michelle, they're kind of middle dwellers. Where are you guys? There we go. John and Michelle Perry. Scott and Sandy Martin, they're over in this area usually. 
And then Steve and Sandra Owens right over here always sit there. Sandra's, oh, Sandra's downstairs. Sandra doesn't come to church here anymore. So. <laughs> these are our elders. Would you just give their family, these families a hand? We love these guys. Oh, there she is. There's Sandra. Making the, now, now you can sit down. Who do I, do I leave? Oh, yeah, Bill and Lynette Bass. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, actually, this is hilarious. Stand up. This is funny. Because, see, Bill's my shepherd. <laughs> I think I just got traded. <laughs> That's hilarious. Are they on here? You're on here. You're, I even wrote you down. So, oh, well. Okay. Dur- during our Bible class hour this morning, each, uh, each flock uh, met with its shepherd to better understand how, how this model is going to function and to answer any questions anybody might have. If you're a member here and you did not get an email or a letter or a phone call telling you which flock you're in and where to meet, that's an oversight by me or Steve Krieger. So if you just contact us, we'll correct that. Uh, if you're not a member here and you have questions about any of this, please feel free to, to talk to any, any of us on staff or any of our elders. You can email me, jody at twickenham.org. And uh, one of us will be glad to respond and answer any questions. Speaking of guests, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that if you're visiting today, this is probably not exactly what you were expecting, this sort of in-house stuff, um, and maybe not even what you were hoping for. But if you are thinking about making Twickenham your church home, we're, we're honored by that and we'd love for you to do that. But this is a, a really good opportunity for you to see kind of how we handle family business. We try to be open and direct and upfront. I'm not going to tell you that we always succeed at that, but that's our, that's our goal. Um, and even if you're, if you're not planning on, uh, if you're not looking for a church home and you're not thinking about Twickenham, you still have a stake in how leaders lead in this church and how this church follows their leadership, which is what we're going to talk about in this, the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. We talk a lot about the responsibilities of the shepherds or the elders to the church. This morning, I want to talk about our responsibilities uh, to the shepherds, the responsibilities the church has to our elders. So I want to look in a passage in Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews is in the New Testament. It's, in the, it's on the kind of the back end of the New Testament. Probably be okay to start at Revelation and back up a little bit uh, to Hebrews chapter 13. This passage, we're going to look at two verses in this passage, or maybe three, that describe what I think are three important responsibilities that you and I have to these men and their wives that stood up here a moment ago. The responsibility we have to our shepherds and their families. First one's in verse 7, and I'm reading from the, the uh, New Living Translation. Okay, here it is. Remember, we have it? We do. Thank you, guys. Remember your leaders. And I'll just add right here that the, that the word there is not one of the typical words for an elder or a shepherd or an overseer or a pastor. It's a word that just describes leaders, but I think it definitely applies to the men who fill this role. Uh, Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow their example. Our first responsibility as a church to our elders, to our shepherds, to our pastors is the responsibility of imitation. To, To follow the example of their faith. Look, you and I selected these men precisely because they embodied certain commendable qualities that that we think a a person of God ought to have. Uh, A a lot like those described in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Listen to this. This is the kind of qualities that that, that we we look for in leaders, and and we selected these men based on, on, on this and other passages. So an elder must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having people in his home. 
He must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? An elder must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. And people also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. Now, if you knew somebody who embodied those qualities and you aspired to live those qualities, wouldn't it make sense to follow the example of the, of the person who has done exactly what you are aspiring to do? It, now, I'm not, not going to suggest in any way that any of the men that stood up here a minute ago are perfect men. They are not. Every one of them is a sinner saved by God's grace, just like you or I are saved by God's grace. But their lives have borne good fruit with the guidance of God's Spirit and, and their willingness to submit to the lordship and leadership of Jesus. These men have made consistently good life decisions and their lives reflect the results of those decisions. The fact that we selected them to, to, to be leaders in our church is an affirmation of their lifestyles. And so the writer of Hebrews says, you obviously recognize something about these men that you thought was a positive thing. Now you imitate that. You follow their example. When we, when we think about leadership, I think this is a problem that we have with our definitions of leadership. When we think about leadership, I think there's a tendency to focus only on issues that revolve around stuff like governance and organizational theory. But leadership is, is about a lot more than just how decisions are made or who makes decisions. The goal of leadership is not just good decisions. The goal of, of leadership is good living. The goal of leadership is not just about how to uh, run an organization well, it's about a well-lived life. We want leaders in the church to be men who take us closer and closer to Jesus. It's, it's, it's about becoming more and more like Him. And because our elders have walked with God for a long, long time, they're able to lead others. They're able to lead us in that direction as well. Hoy, would you kind of be coming forward here so you can lead us in a prayer in just a second? We are to follow our leaders as they follow Christ, but we are not so naive to think that they're somehow immune to temptation. We had a microphone for you right there, Hoy. We're not, we're not immune, naive to think that they're immune to temptation, uh, and so we, in fact, we know they're not. If I were the devil and I wanted to undermine what was going on here at Twickenham, one of the first things I would try to do would be to compromise the lives of our leaders. And so we, we've asked Hoy Ledbetter, who is a man so many of us know and, and all who know him respect him, we've asked Hoy to lead us in a prayer for our shepherds that God will protect them from the evil one and, and so that they can continue to lead us by example and that we will follow their leadership. Hoy, please pray for us. Our Father, we thank you that you listened to us this morning and that you're very interested in what's going on in this room. And we come to you as people who are desirous of doing what the Bible has indicated we should do to follow those who are worthy of imitation. And in the selection of the men who are serving in this capacity in this congregation, we are all committed to being imitators of their faith because we believe their faith is worth imitating. But Father, we recognize also as we review history that it doesn't always work out that way. That sometimes the faith becomes weak and the vision of God becomes so shallow that self takes the place and people start doing what they want to do rather than what they think God wants to do. 
that causes tremendous damage to the church. And Father, we ask you to interfere if such a tendency takes place among us, that you will prevent that from happening, that you will protect the men who uh, are serving in this congregation from becoming self-centered in any way, but they will maintain a strong faith in you, one that is always worth imitating. We thank you and ask your help in protecting them from the evil one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Hoy. Thank you so much. So our first responsibility uh, is imitation. Okay, follow the example of your leaders. We're to follow them as they follow Christ. Our second responsibility is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, just 10 verses down. Okay, can we see that, that passage here? Here's what it says. Obey, your, obey uh, your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Boy, that, I guarantee you, every elder in this room knows that verse and, and it, it, it at some point keeps them up at night. Obey your spiritual leaders, do whatever they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they, are, uh, and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Our second, first responsibility is imitation. Our second is submission, which is a word that might give you some heartburn. Submission to authority is not, that's not really an American thing, is it? We just don't, I mean, this is the land of Henry David Thoreau, of civil disobedience, of walking to your own, you know, marching to the beat of your own drummer. Submission to authority is, for very many of us, like an ill-fitting shoe. We, we don't want to feel cramped. We don't want to feel constrained. We don't want to feel controlled. And some of us, I'm not going to ask any hands to go up here, but some of us have known church leaders who were overbearing and seemed to enjoy having authority just a little bit too much, and we did not like it. Jesus didn't like that either. Matthew chapter 20, Jesus called his disciples together. I want you to listen to what he said to them. He said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them, but among you, it will be different. And I don't, I don't really think that Jesus is being descriptive there. I don't think he's saying, you know, it's not going to be that way. Well, I think he's, that, that's an order. He's saying it's going to be different in the kingdom. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave because even the son of man did not come to to be served but to serve others and to give his life a ransom for many in other words in the kingdom of god leaders are to exercise their authority from a place of humility not power i'll tell you when lisa and i were in conversation with this church about about coming here we listened very, very attentively as we thought about whether we were going to leave what had been home for 30 years and move to Huntsville. And one of the things that we really listened carefully about was what kind of elders did this church have? And we listened to the, to listen to the staff talk. We listened to the search committee. We didn't, I don't know that we ever asked the question directly, but I can tell you we were very keenly interested in, in finding out whether we were going to wind up in an environment that was all about control and dominance and power. And if that's the way it was, we didn't want to have anything to do with it. So we listened to staff. We listened to the search committee. We listened very carefully to the shepherds. We prayed about it. And we, we did not hear a whiff of anything that smelled authoritarian, dictatorial, or officious. And our experience since we signed on has done nothing but to confirm our initial impressions. These guys just do not operate out of a place of power. 
That's due in large measure to who they are in Jesus, which is why I feel confident calling us to follow their examples. But it's also due to how Scripture describes the role of the elders or the eldership. And, and, and uh, this church is, is determined to follow Scripture as best we can as we understand it. You see, the authority that, that I'm talking about here, we're talking about our, our responsibility to the, to, the, to the elders is to submit to their authority. The authority that we're talking about is not invested in a single man. It's invested in a group of men. It would be dangerous if one elder, if one shepherd, if one pastor, if one overseer, all of those terms are used interchangeably to describe the same role, it, it would be very dangerous if one person possessed all the power in a local church. Our sense here at Twickenham is that God, through Scripture, calls for a plurality of shepherds, pastors, elders, overseers, and the authority is invested in that group. We are called to submit to the authority not to a single elder, but to the eldership. Now, that does not mean that you and I are always going to agree with their decisions. Sometimes they'll come out with a decision and we will wonder, what have they been smoking? It doesn't mean that we can't say we disagree. Look, we're still in the honeymoon stage. Lisa and I are still in the honeymoon stage with, with you and with the elders. I think we are. It hasn't happened yet. But at some point, the elders are going to reach one conclusion, and I'm going to reach another. Naturally, they'll be wrong when that happens. <laughs> but unless we're talking about a matter of faith, my, my responsibility will be to submit to their authority, and I will do that. I've done that before in, in other situations. Didn't agree with the decision, but they're, they're the shepherds. Okay, that, That'll be my requirement. That's what this passage teaches. That's what I think this passage here in Hebrews chapter 17, verse 13 teaches. I don't think there are too many other ways to spin that. Lee Segrist, can you come on down and uh, y'all, that makes y'all nervous when I do that because you think I'm start calling people out and bringing them up. <laughs> Lee has not been obedient to the shepherds. So <laughs> there's a mic right there for you. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. If a leader or a group of leaders relishes the opportunity to exercise their authority, it's hard to submit just on general principles. But if a group of men are known to be high in character and low in ego, submission is easy. I believe we have a group of elders who are of high character but lead with humility. And I've asked Lee to come and, and pray both for our elders and for us that, that they will continue to lead us with gentleness and humility and that we will submit to their leadership in humility. Lee, pray for us, please. Would you bow with me? Thank you, Father, for, for this beautiful Lord's Day that we uh, have and for every opportunity that we have to come together as a body of your people. Thank you for hearing our prayer this morning and for being mindful of us as your children, Father. We are truly blessed to have the privilege of approaching your throne with prayer. And uh, this morning we have special prayer for the men that serve this congregation as our elders. Father, we ask that you... Grant these men a special measure of love and wisdom and discretion as they make the decisions that guide the path of this body. Their burden is, is often heavy as they concern themselves with the spiritual health and well-being of each member of this flock. And at times, Father, I'm sure their uh, duty seems thankless. I ask that uh, each of us as a part of this family would lift them up and their families up, Father, in prayer each day. And pray that uh, each of us in this congregation resolve to be an encouragement to them and a blessing to them in every way that we can. Father, we ask that uh, you help our she uh, shepherds to lead by example. Help them to be submissive to the ultimate authority that we serve. Help them to serve with the spirit of uh, a servant and uh, with humility, with a gentle spirit. 
being careful not to become proud in their office. Father, help our shepherds to be guided by your spirit and to be constantly in prayer to you collectively and individually so they can keep their eyes focused on you and in turn that we would keep our eyes focused on you and your son in whose name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lee. So our responsibility to our shepherds is first of all to imitate their faith as they imitate Jesus himself, to submit to their authority, and then finally in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 18, the writer tells his people there just three words, pray for us. We have the responsibility of imitation, of submission, and then finally intercession. We need to pray for our elders. If we follow their example, we will grow to become more spiritually mature people. If we submit to their authority, they will lead us closer to God. And if we pray for them diligently, then God will enable and empower them to serve and lead us well. I've known a lot of elders through the years. I've known a lot of men who became elders. And I knew them before they were elders and then after they became one. And I'm going to tell you that something happens to a man when he becomes an elder. He answers the phone differently when it rings. Before he opens up his email, he takes a deep breath. Before he speaks a word, he thinks twice and sometimes three times. If a tear wells up in a member's eye, a lot of the shepherds I have known through the years tasted the salt. If one of the sheep struggles with a burden, a lot of the elders I've known through the years felt the weight of that burden. Our, our, our shepherds struggle with the same things we do. Okay? They're, they're normal people. The fears that you have, they've had those. The doubts, the temptations, frustrations. You got sadnesses, they do too, disappointments. They not only have to handle their own struggles and burdens and junk, but they have to help shoulder ours as well. It's honestly, it's a wonder that elders don't walk around with stooped shoulders much of the time, and some of them do. I've seen men age dramatically when they became elders. And so they need our intercession. You and I need to remember them every day in prayer and their families. Bring their names up to the Creator every single day. And then after you have done that, you need to tell them that you prayed for them. I love it when you pray for me. I, I love it even more when you say, hey, I prayed for you. That It matters that we know that. Tim, can you come on up? Tim Logan's going to come up and pray to, for us that God will give our shepherds the strength and stamina for their work and that you and I will be faithful in holding our elders up in prayer. Tim? God, what a blessing it is to be a shepherd here with his family. But with that blessing comes many challenges and struggles. And God, I just ask you to, to be with our elders as, as they walk with us, as they go through this journey with each, with each one of us. God, give them strength. Father, help them to, help them to know what to say and how to say it. God, give them wisdom. Draw, the, draw them close to you. Help them to always be in your will. But God, help them to always know how much we love them. God, help them to be steadfast in prayer for each of us. Help them to be diligent in study. And God, as as we lift you up in prayer every day, help us to always lift them up. And God, as, as we tell them how supportive 
and how thankful we are for each one of them. Help us to tell them and let them know that we are praying for them. And God, as, as Jody said in the beginning of, uh, beginning of this service, help us to not take our, ourselves so seriously but help us to take our walk with you seriously. Help us to love our elders. And thank you so much for Jesus. And it's only through his grace and mercy that we are who we are, and this family is who it is. Amen. Thank you, Tim. The beginning of the message, I mentioned that, that while this is not your typical you know, rah-rah New Year's Sunday sermon, it's very foundational. What, there's an important subtext to all that we've done this morning from our, uh, even before we came into here, our, during the, the Sunday school hour uh, and all through now, we're trying to create an environment where everyone is cared for, where we're all cared for, where we're all supported, where we're all encouraged, and where we, were all, where we are all caring for and supporting and encouraging somebody else. You see, it's, at some point in this new year, at some point, and, and it may be today, you're going to need somebody to, to step up and be there for you, to care for you. And at some point, you're going to need to step up and be there for somebody, e even, even if you're still struggling. We, we just have to be there for each other. It does not matter how many New Year's resolutions you make or, or how much resolve you have. Life is a team sport. God designed it that way. You and I are blessed to be a part of this team. And it, it's a blessing that we must never take for granted. Writing under the cloud of, of Hitler's Nazi regime, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in, in what is a, a classic meditation on what it means to live in Christian community, described the grace-given joy of Christian community. Here's what he wrote. Therefore, let them who have had the privilege of living a common Christian life with other Christians Praise God on their knees and declare, it is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brothers and sisters. It is grace, and this grace of our being a part of this body, whether you sit on this side or that side or up there, this grace is a joy. Let's stand. Let's sing out that joy together. The joy of the Lord will, will be my strength. I will not fall to, I will not daze. I is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of standing for just a moment I couldn't get verses two or three so we'll just stop right there um, as we close just three quick things Four, actually first of all thanks for being a part of this family and if you're a guest thank you for being with us also um, our winter ABF classes our adult Bible fellowship classes start next Sunday we haven't had regular class 
for three weeks, so those new classes are starting up, and you'll get a listing of those emailed this week, and it'll be available on the website. Number two, three, the spring is next Sunday night. We didn't have the spring in December because of busy, busy schedules, but we'll be starting that back up next Sunday at 5 o'clock. Instrumental Praise and Worship, please be here for that. And ladies, there's an upcoming women's conference. The ladies' ministry is planning to attend the Mountain Brook Community Church's Women's Conference, Fearless Faith Without Fear, on Saturday, January the 30th. Additional details about that are in your bulletin. Hope you have a great week in this new year, and we'll close in prayer. Thanks for being here today. Dear God in heaven, we, we acknowledge your presence here, not just here, but in our lives. We acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Savior. We acknowledge the Holy Spirit as it leads us in his presence here. We acknowledge the heavenly host that fights battles for us in the spiritual realm and their presence here. We acknowledge those who have gone before us and their presence here in our hearts. We thank you for this place and for you raising up elders to lead us. We thank you so much for leading us here. And we thank you, especially for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.